You guys ready? How you guys doing? Thanks for hanging in there. I know it's late in the day. You guys are probably eager to get to your beers. Uh, my name is Gretchen Curtis. I'm a co-founder and chief marketing officer of Piston Cloud. And uh, this is the press and analyst industry perspectives on OpenStack. So we did this panel about um, six months ago at the last summit. Um, a couple of the panelists here are, uh, are old timers. So uh, why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves? You want me to start? Yep. Uh, hi, I'm Gary Chen. Uh, I'm a research manager at uh, IDC. And uh, I cover server virtualization software and cloud system software, which is what we call stuff like OpenStack. I'm uh, Sean Michael Kerner. I'm a senior editor at Internet News, which is part of the Queen Street Enterprise Network. Uh, write for a pile of publications under that name and uh, write cloud, application development, Linux, open source, networking, and security stuff. I'm Stephen O'Grady. I'm the co-founder of Redmunk. Uh, and well, probably on, uh, on the panel because I cover cloud, among other things. I'm Alex Williams. I write for TechCrunch. I cover the enterprise and a lot of cloud stuff. Cool. So before we get started, can I see a show of hands how many developers we have in the audience? <coughs> okay, a few. How about users? People who are here? Okay. How about uh, vendors? Vendors. All right. Okay, so the last time we did this about six months ago in San Diego, um, we covered a, a number of hot topics at the time, including governance. We had a newly formed foundation at the time. Uh, we talked about the hype of OpenStack, specifically uh, the high degree of uh, marketing maturity relative to uh, the technical maturity of OpenStack. Uh, I believe this, the saying was, the proof is in the pudding, now where the hell is the pudding? So um, we also talked about uh, concerns about community infighting, um, concerns about the involvement of large corporate players with competing interests getting involved too early in the project. Um, but mostly we talked about two things, uh, which was the lack of users and customer stories and the immaturity of the technology. So um, six months later, Grizzly is out, the foundation is strong, community is thriving, governance is working, Hype is still high, um, but as we saw this morning, um, we now have a, a large number of customers using OpenStack in production in lots of interesting ways. So um, if the proof is in the pudding, I think we can agree we've seen a lot of pudding. Uh, so now what? Uh, I want to ask you guys, uh, you know, what's the buzz you guys are seeing now overall? Positive, negative, uh, a mix? Um. <coughs> The buzz is, you know, I think it's um, still uh, pretty great for OpenStack. I mean, there's not a lot to lose at this point. I think, you know, just from my observations, it's going, we're moving closer to what will become, I guess, somewhat of a horse race, but there's going to be so many different kinds of clouds out there, I'm not sure what kind of a horse race it's going to be. Um, much more focus on, on money and um, how VMware is going to get displaced. So, I, I think I would agree with uh, most of what Alex just said. You know, I think from my perspective, you know, I think that the buzz, or at least the important buzz, is on sort of the continued momentum for the project. Uh, you know, certainly we've heard from uh, some users, you know, this time around, or at least more users, which is a good thing. You know, I think the you know, the, really the question, you know, or the sort of buzz around the question that I hear, uh, you know, still concerns fragmentations, you know, still concerns sort of the number of competing interests and agendas, because one of the things that's beginning to happen that you see is, is that, uh, you know, a lot of vendors uh, and even, you know, a lot of their customers are beginning to understand the stakes involved, right? Which is, you know, look, if you do not have a sort of credible strategy, you do not have a credible vision of where things are going, you know, from a cloud perspective, and more importantly, you're poised to get there, you have a serious problem. And you know, therefore, we're seeing sort of vendors scramble to, to find their footing, and uh, that will make for a very interesting environment in the OpenStack community moving forward. I, uh, I see the buzz, and I agree with everything that's been said so far, so no arguments yet. Uh, I think the buzz is even greater now, six months out. Uh, if you probably if we did a Google Seed case, and somebody in here probably can in the next five seconds. Uh, the volume of OpenStack stories uh, that I've seen in the last six months has increased. I have not spoken to anybody about cloud in the last 
180 days in which OpenStack was not part of the conversation. Before, it might only have been 80%. And the risk that I see is people talk, and I know we might talk about interoperability or security or other things, but the standard risks that are associated with any cloud, not necessarily OpenStack, and that's what I hear on my side. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I agree with everyone. I mean, uh, you know, in terms of uh, community, uh, the software itself, uh, the foundation, all that momentum's continued uh, at an you know, extremely uh, fast pace. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, we have seen more users. Um, you know, I mean, I think, I think it's still confined to certain use cases, certain uh, segments of the market. You know, I think uh, a lot of the uh, focus this year is kind of how do I take it commercial, a lot of vendors coming out with products, um, you know, how do I get into enterprise. Um, I find that, uh, you know, there is a lot of recognition of OpenStack uh, within the enterprise. Um, and so they are interested in the platform. I think the majority don't know that much about it yet, um, but uh, I think that's likely to, to change. Um, and uh, I also think, you know, the private cloud, I think everyone's going there, but uh, I think what I've seen from enterprise is that, um, you know, I, I think people are expecting it's gonna happen within like a year or something. That's not, you know, there's not gonna be a, you know, the, the crest of the market is, is coming, but uh, so, uh, Um, in your view, what are the most exciting new technology develop developments happening at OpenStack right now? And um, six months ago, we talked about what's there uh, versus what's still missing. So what's still missing? Um, well, I mean, I guess the things that I hear, I don't really actually hear too much about things that are missing. I mean, there are things that are missing, but I don't know if it's like something that's just not solvable over time. So there's like, you know, cool networking stuff that's going on, cool storage things. You know, f when I talk to, I, I talk more to like enterprises than, than uh, a lot of service providers. And, and enterprises are kind of more, more or less asking for some of the VMware features that they've been used to, right? So like, you know, shared storage, fiber channel, SANS, and live migration. Some of that's starting to get built in. You know, they ask for like VMware style HA, you know. So, you know, I think they're coming from kind of a different expectation from features. But, um, you know, I, I think the really the biggest thing now is really not that, uh, that features are gonna be the big blocker, but that what you really need is to make it accessible to a wider market, and that's really making it easier to consume, easier to install, get skills, and get training, and documentation. I mean, I, I think that's really the big, the big thing on features, but, you know, features are always nice. <laughs> uh, for me, last time we were here, we talked about, you know, Quantum and to just come in as a project, and now I know that Foundation wants to just rebrand it as OpenStack Networking. Good luck, because everybody knows the name already. But uh, in the last six months now, Quantum has gone from being an idea to something that every major networking vendor is now basing their plans upon. Even, you know, this week, Juniper, and Juniper, six months ago, they were in the CloudStack camp, and uh, there's no CloudStack people in here, uh, and there won't be in six months uh, either, because uh, it's, it's going away, because that's, that's one thing, that's, that's hot. And then there's everything else that's associated with that. And I've had the chance to sit in a few of these design sessions this week, but um, load balancing is a service, which I know is in Grizzly. Firewall is a service, is remarkably a brilliant idea. Uh, how it gets implemented, I think, will be very tricky. DNS as a service is, is incredibly uh, interesting also. Uh, and then some of these other emerging ideas that I see, I think tomorrow morning we're gonna hear about Red Dwarf Database as a service from the HP people. There's a Spoiler alert for those of you in the audience. Uh, Brian Acker is going to be talking about that, the guy who helped create MySQL. So I think there's a lot of excitement to come. You know, I think for my part, you know, the difficulty of the question is, is that, and this is going to sound funny coming from an analyst, um, but I say this all the time, is that in the technology space, we spend way too much time talking about technology, period. You know, and I think in the case of, you know, sort of OpenStack, I mean, you know, many of you in the room, think back to the first couple releases. I mean, do you remember what that project was like? It was terrible. You couldn't, up, you know, you couldn't upgrade from one version to another. Things didn't work. You know, pieces that were completely absent. You know, and yet we're all still here. We're all still in this room. So, you know, to me, I think you know Gary raised a, a great point, which is when we look at the sort of list of you know sort of technically inferior solutions that have triumphed over technically superior solutions. That's a really damn long list, right? So, you know, yes, there are sort of important technology considerations here. 
But the most important thing to me is going to come down to packaging, um, you know, essentially the, you know, streamlining the install, sort of upgrade maintenance, et cetera, process. Because you know, so much of adoption, so much of usage comes down to convenience, not features. I guess you know one of the things that I'm looking at through is is the perception of the of what the customer is uh, thinking about right now, and and you know just in talking with um, you know, vendors and analysts and listening to some of the cu customer conversations is you know they're they're fully virtualized, they're up to like almost 80 percent, and now they're trying to figure out what to do next, and. There are some that are going toward towards already adopting the cloud director, but that's a that gets very very expensive, and so now they're starting to look at alternatives, <clears throat> and still, there's that issue about uh, OpenStack and its complexity, and how do you really um, how do you really adapt it to you know your particular needs? But they're they're just trying to weigh what what to do because in the meantime, all their um, Product groups are starting to continue to use use the public cloud, Amazon Web Services, and stuff. And so I, I you know, and I so I, I think there is lots of exciting talk about what is the next generation of technology. But again, it's always the customers who are trying to figure out, well, you know, how do I transition, you know, uh, from what I have right now, which is pretty complex and pretty pretty expensive, you know, into something that is you know more adaptable and something I can federate to some extent. Um, switching gears here really quickly, um, interoperability is um, something that's received a lot of press recently. A couple of our articles have come out just in the last few weeks um, criticizing OpenStack for lack of interoperability. So um, I want to ask you guys two questions. One, what does interoperability mean to you? And two, does it matter? So Steve, since you think that's funny, why don't you start? <laughs> uh, I guess that's fair. Uh, you know, I think with respect to OpenStack, the definitions of interoperability are all, are all over the map. It really depends on what we're talking about. In the context of OpenStack, to me, there are two primary considerations, which is, you know, the first, in terms of the components themselves, are they compatible from vendor to vendor, from implementer to implementer, all right? In other words, you know, is, you know, sort of core compute, storage, networking, uh, et cetera, are they compatible? Are they essentially the same, you know, sort of version of the asset? You know, so that's question one. Question two, you know, and this sort of actually begs the question of what is the OpenStack project and what constitutes, or what constitutes the OpenStack project is, well, which components are we talking about, right? Because in other words, you have implementers now who are picking different storage components. So if, you know, the compute interrupts, but we're using different storage components, is that interoperable? I, I don't know. I mean, you know, it depends on sort of what customers talk to us about. So, you know, really, I think when we talk about interoperability in the case of OpenStack, those are the two dimensions you need to look at. And frankly, I think from users yet, we don't have enough feedback to say, hey, this is what a, you know, sort of a, a interoperable uh, definition equates to. This is, th this is where it gets outside of my domain, and I, and I want to ask you guys some questions. Isn't, that the <laughs> isn't it the, um, the benefit of OpenStack that it does have that modularity and you can you know, fit these different pieces together if you do have that expertise? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, um, yeah, I mean, interop, I think, you know, if you look at it from a customer, right, and you're, you're either doing private or doing public cloud or whatever, you know, what you really care about is, you know, if you're doing private cloud, if I switch vendors, you know, how painful is that experience? Or if you're looking at, you know, if I source from a public cloud provider, if I want to switch, you know, what's the time and cost involved in that, right? And so it's, it's like what Steven said, you know, there's, there's you know, how assets implemented, it's APIs, and there's a lot of things, but, you know, I think that's what you're really trying to accomplish if, if you have interop and, and, and you want choice of, you know, accessory items and stuff like that, right, stuff that goes on top of OpenStack, is it, you know, is it all going to work with all the various flavors of OpenStack? And um, so, I mean, I think OpenStack has brought some level of standardization to, uh, you know, to the market, but I think the question is, is like, you know, so it'll make it better, but how much better? Is it a little better or a lot better? Like in practicality, like how much is that gonna matter when you factor in all this other stuff that is not standardized or, or interoperable? And, um, and, and that's the thing, I, I just don't think we know yet because no one's really tried to do it and no one's really tested it. And, and that's, I think that is something that the foundation maybe could take a lead on, right? So, you know, enforcing and, and testing, you know, uh, 
to put stamps on minimum levels and for public cloud providers too. And, and the public cloud is not just a technical thing. I think there's a there's business interrupt too because if you want to move to a cloud, there's there's the kind of business integration has to be done and you know, running another federation and other things that could create headaches. Well, and just for the record, uh, you know, on the, on the point of the foundation, I think the foundation has to take initiative. I think they're the only ones who can. I'll just argue devil's advocate here on interoperability uh, for the developers and the network guys and the server guys in the audience. Uh, everybody, you guys will know what POSIX compliance means. And POSIX was supposed to be a standard for interoperability across Unix. Can you run a workload or is HPUX compliant and interoperable with IBM AIX, <laughs> Linux and Macs, which are theoretically all POSIX compliant? The answer is uh, no. So what does interoperability mean? Interoperability <coughs> is something, a myth that no vendors can perpetrate. And POSIX compliance means a certain thing at a very baseline level. Now, the higher level we have on the web world, which all of us are also familiar with, you have a web browser through kind of sort of standards, HTML5, everything is interoperability, interoperable through the browser. So bringing it back to OpenStack, at the barest level, if you're using a standard OVF image file or AMI image file or a Zen image file or a KVM image file, if you're using the same hypervisor in another OpenStack cloud, I don't care if you're certified interoperability or not, it's the same hypervisor and theoretically it should run. There may be some other levels of abstraction. The other layer of abstraction that exists today is there's the Glance Image Service, which if I'm not mistaken, kind of, sort of, is backwards compatible from Grizzly to Folsom. So if you take an image, it goes back and forth. Where there is no compatibility uh, and interoperability today, which is where I think the foundation needs to take a, a giant leap, is where VMware has a massive lead in this massive idea of VM motion across vCloud compliant data centers. So I can migrate an entire workload with its whole stack across the data center. Can't do that, but uh, if there's any VMware customers in the audience, you tell me how you can do that without significant hardware uh, to accelerate that workload anyway. So the idea of interoperability in the cloud today is nice, but uh, it's still a work in progress. Okay, so um, just a couple more questions and then we'll open it up for audience. So um, in your view, what is the biggest challenge OpenStack will face in the next six months? Alex, you wanna start us off? The biggest challenge of a tackle face in the next six months. Um, I think it was expressed a little bit today uh, when Jonathan was giving his keynote and he was saying, and he was addressing some of the uh, complaints that there weren't enough uh, examples of providers, uh, a few, you know, when, when OpenSAC was in its earliest days, but now that there's complaints about that there's too many providers, um, and that seems to me get to the heart of you know where the direction of OpenStack goes and what role those uh, those providers will pay, uh, play. Um, what role will IBM play? You know what role will these these big vendors play, and how will that um, how will that be reflected in in OpenStack overall, especially when we're talking about such issues as interoperability. Yeah, I think for for my money, you know the, the biggest challenge at OpenStack, you know faces you know, is basically figuring out what OpenStack is. Uh, you know, what constitutes OpenStack? What is sort of an OpenStack implementation? What does that look like? What components does it, you know, need to include if it needs to include any? You know, these are the kinds of, of questions, you know, to me that need to be answered because the alternative is that, you know, you have differing implementations and then, you know, from that standpoint, you have customers who are theoretically implementing OpenStack in many cases to free themselves from lock-in only to find themselves locked into a different vendor because the underlying componentry is different. Doesn't that go to the heart of the organizational structure behind OpenStack to some extent? And the well, way that's why I said, you know, to me the, the foundation, you know, sort of needs to play a leading role in terms of determining, hey, this is what OpenStack is, this is when you can use the term OpenStack, you know, they need to monitor the trademark. You know, these are the levers that we've seen work historically. And, you know, I think without you know, some guidance, you know, the danger is, is that you get down the line, and as I said, you have a whole bunch of different open stacks that don't look like open stacks. I'll agree with you, and I know we kind of talked about this a little bit uh, six months ago, because fragmentation is something that's kind of messed up with Android, but I see it in a, in a technical sense, because of the rapid rate of innovation every six months. Public clouds may be able to migrate, I know the Rackspace guys are pulling from trunk, what, every day, whatever, so they can migrate quickly. Uh, private clouds are not gonna migrate 
quickly. So we're going to have enterprises stuck on a certain release. I'm not so worried about the vendors that that will happen. And then you may have to deal with compatibility across releases. So I think the biggest challenge for OpenStack is to come to a Linux type model on enterprise long-term support releases from a foundation level such that you're not going to be supporting all releases, but there'll be an N plus one or N plus two for 18 months or three months or whatever, knowing that the foundation and the core development team is supporting a release for a period of time, and then you know the vendors will backport there. But that's where I see uh, a challenge. The model has to change, because three, uh, three years, two, three years, new releases every six months is great, it's sustainable, but there needs to be an enterprise support model built into the development. But do you really see it changing? Yes, because it worked in Linux, and we had the same thing. We have now Linux kernels out every 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, Greg Crow Harton is a fellow of the Linux Foundation. He maintains stable kernels, and then when he doesn't need to maintain those stable kernels, and the individuals do, but there has to be somebody who steps up and says, hey, look, this kernel I'm going to be supporting, and we're doing it in this kernel. This open stack release, such as, and I'm going to be supporting it upstream and Git for a period of time, and then people won't have to worry about fragmentation. That, that can happen. There are historical precedences. Gary? Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think interop is, is that huge uh, issue because, you know, I mean, I, I think that's a big, a big differentiating value proposition for OpenStack, right? To, to have this kind of interop between public and private, and public and public and all of that. And, uh, and I think like what Steven said, a lot of that comes down to standardization, right? How do you prevent annoying little flavors that uh, you know will cause you a lot of headache down the road, and you're, you're just trading you know one vendor for another. So um, you know I, I think there's a value prop that that customers and, and OpenStack is really put out as one of its main things. So I think they have to deliver on that. Um, so they, I think if they don't, that that the, the project loses a lot of uh, appeal for a lot of people. Um, I think the other part is really just making the software consumable. Uh, I think like I just talked about before, just making it. Uh, easier, more convenient for people to, to, uh, to use. And that'll get it to kind of more segments of the market. Um, and um, you know, I think the other challenge is, you know, maybe not a challenge for OpenStack, but uh, you know, I think indirectly, you know, I think a lot of people are expecting um, you know, and, and looking at fast commercialization and success, right? You know, where's the money coming in? And uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think in six months that you know, if it doesn't, uh, you know, if there's doesn't a billion mar a billion dollar market doesn't appear, that I, uh, you know, I would consider it a failure. But I, I think there's a lot of people that uh, expect fast results and maybe faster than what was really realistic. So uh, I think there's always the danger of that kind of hype and, and people saying, well, it's been so, you know, six months after six months and there's not, not a lot of money. But, you know, six months is six months. I mean, uh, we only expect these markets to develop over there. I, I always get constant questions about it. Where's, it, where's the money for OpenStack? I'm like, you know, this thing's only been out for like, you know, a couple of years and it's just starting out. It's like, you know, you gotta kind of relax a little <laughs> be patient. Gary, is OpenStack a sure thing? Um, depends what you call a sure thing. I mean, I, I think OpenStack as a, as a technology has probably gotten to the point where like, you know, the, the train can't be stopped. And I, I think that the technology is going to <laughs> work its way into a lot of stuff. Um, but exactly, you know, kind of what the model is, you know, who the players are, or, you know, what kind of you know, distribution model and, you know, products, uh, what the products actually look like and that sort of thing, you know, it's probably, you know, kind of up in the air. But at this point with the community, uh, with the code that it has, um, you know, if you count that, you know, I, I think I would count that as a success. It, it's, a, it's an open source success already. And, and uh, I, I do believe that, you know, if the community is there and the code is good, that, you know, somehow the industry will find a way to turn it into something viable. So I, I just don't think we, maybe we know what that is going to look like. Mm -hmm. But I think at this point, uh, you know, the, the technology is, is, is going to be, you know, widely available in some form. I would agree, you know, the train can't be stopped. Uh, well, maybe it could be, but the, tr tr the, the, uh, the core trajectory now is in the right direction. The vendor momentum is in the right direction. What is the word that Jonathan used this morning? There's a, a gravity that's pulling things, and the nature of all of our enterprises and vendors are such that we, once you get started, there's a certain amount of uh, operational inertia, uh, and uh, Newton's, what is it, second law thermodynamics, an object emotion is going to remain emotional and it's acted upon by a 
equal and opposite force. So unless there is an equal and opposite force equal to this operational inertia, then uh, it'll keep going. Uh, you know, at Red Monk, we tend to believe that uh, the biggest community wins. Um, there are exceptions, but by and large, you know, sort of the largest collective, you know, tends to have the inertia, tends to have the momentum, tends to have, uh, you know, essentially the, the energy, you know, needed to sustain itself and, and certainly grow over time. You know, I think that the one wild card, I think, with, with OpenStack is, is that assuming that it remains the same community moving forward, yes, you know, I would say that, you know, the viability of the project is relatively projectable for, I don't know, for the foreseeable future anyhow. The difficulty, you know, and like I said, the wild card here is if the community ends up fragmenting itself into multiple communities, then all bets are off. Um, if it becomes not OpenStack, but, you know, IBM OpenStack or Red Hat OpenStack or HP OpenStack, um, you know, et cetera, that's a completely different question. And then, you know, I think the ongoing viability of the community is very much in question. So I guess the question I ask as a reporter is, um, if there is momentum for uh, OpenStack, uh, then what is it displacing? So I guess that's my question that, you know, that I have when I think about where OpenStack is, is actually going. And if it is then fragmented, as Steven says, then wh who's the beneficiary, uh, you know, of that fragmentation? Is it the larger vendors, and will that then just, you know, play to their camp? So that's the question that I'm that I'm curious about. If there really is that momentum for OpenStack, um, you know, what are the what are the dynamics there that are impacting uh, the other aspects of the market? So does that mean that VMware is losing momentum? with something like vCloud Director, or is it mean, does it mean that AWS is gaining momentum in other ways? I think those are kind of the questions that I'm, I'm really curious about. If I was, just going on from your thread, if I was trying to figure that out, I would look at see what the uh, workloads are, uh, and what the net new workloads are that are growing, then ask a guy like uh, Gary over here and his IDC quarterly tracker, and I know you gotta do one eventually. Uh, and then we, we could see whether it's growing or displacing. Because uh, again, because I have a background in Linux, Linux did displace Linux. That was pretty e clear, and it's displacing Windows. So is OpenStack displacing VMware, or is it net new growth? Uh, I think it's a combination of the two, and then a combination of just bare metal. Uh, I don't think server volumes. You can answer this better than I could. Server volumes haven't declined necessarily, but uh, five years ago when we, when we were all talking about virtualization. Uh, people thought the server volumes would go down uh, because utilization would go up, but that didn't necessarily happen. So I don't know that there has to be a displacement either, but that's something that's, you know, we should yeah. all pursue. Yeah. I mean, uh, like, you know, there's, you know, if you look at the growth of physical server, I mean, uh, it hasn't been, you know, super impressive, but you look at the line for logical servers, I mean, that's, it, it's a total, it's a total gap between those two. So. Um, you know, and, and it's some of it has to do with the way we count it, right? Units of servers, one box is a box, but you know, we, we know that the, the box is a, it doesn't really, mean, it, it can mean a lot of things. Like it could be a really small box, a really big box. And um, yeah, I, I think, I really do think that, you know, what uh, Sean mentioned, it, it, workloads are key because if you look at the competitors, a lot of them have really different workload profiles, right? Because VMware was stuff made to be totally backwards compatible. And, and, and that's the reason why you know they had such success because it wasn't really disrupted that you could just take whatever you had and put it on there. And uh, then you look at something like Amazon, you look at kind of, uh, I think most OpenStack implementations. It was, that wasn't really made to run that kind of workload, right? I mean, it was, it was like, you know, you could, but you wouldn't really be guaranteed any, any great uptime or anything like that. It was really meant for a new application that was developed for cloud. So, you know, I, I don't think, um, we will see a lot of displacement as in I'm taking your workload that was running on this hypervisor or this platform and then I'm going to move it. I, I, I think there, I think that's, uh, you know, it's not easy to do. And I don't know if there's a lot of reason for customers that they really want to do it. Um, and um, I mean, we do see migrations in some cases, right? But uh, I think for the most part, people try to avoid that. It's not, it's not something that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think when you look at new workloads, you have to look at what's really being generated. There's still a lot of the old stuff being uh, sold and implemented, and a lot of that's going to go on uh, what we know today is just you know, kind of standard server virtualization, and then there's new apps 
that are really fit for, more for cloud. And, and, and granted, both platforms are kind of going both ways, right? VMware is trying to get into the Amazon space and you know, OpenStack becoming more uh, kind of uh, with enterprise features. Um, but uh, you know, I think at this point, there's still a pretty different workload profile between OpenStack and like a VMware. So um, it, I think it's really about, you know, how, if someone's deploying a new workload, can you convince them to do it one way or another? Um, or, uh, you know, the ISVs, you know, what, what are they what are they developing for their customers? Steven, in terms of uh, developer, you know, the, the developer com um, component there, um, how would how would you judge this if you're looking at you know this kind of comparison across different kinds of workloads? You know, where do you see the development focus <coughs> as it relates to OpenStack versus you know um, uh, VMware type environments? Well, you know, to me, I think the the simplest way to look at that is is you know when you talk to customers, um, you know, users sort of of all shapes and sizes, right? The question there is. You know, how many of them sort of prior to an OpenStack, prior to CloudStack, prior to Eucalyptus, prior to all these sort of would be, uh, you know, sort of, you know, cloud layers. You know, how many of them look like Amazon? How many of them look like a private cloud? And the answer in most cases is zero. Um, you know, which means that from a technology perspective, you know, OpenStack's penetration is, is largely additive. You know, certainly in some places it overlaps and displaces technologies like VMware. But, you know, by and large, you know, most people are trying to make yeah, their infrastructure to look more like a public cloud for the first time, right? Um, in, in terms of sort of what that means in terms of the developer perspective, you know, as I said before, we tend to bet on the largest community and, you know, sort of one of the other factors from a developer perspective is basically that the simplest technology to acquire, install, and implement usually wins. And, you know, it's a, it's a lesson that's lost, you know, and, you know, we talk to vendors sort of of all shapes and sizes, and they all come back to us again, you know, as I said before, they all want to talk about technology. They all want to talk speeds and feeds and performance and features and knobs and bells and whistles and so on. And at the end of the day, that's all great. And, you know, technology is a wonderful thing. But, you know, really the technology that's easiest to implement, um, the easiest to obtain is likely to be the one that wins. And, you know, right now I think OpenStack does an okay job of that. You know, certainly I think there's been a focus in the last couple of releases on that. Um, there's been a lot of work you know, sort of in that space, but there's a long way to go before we know one way or another that this is going to be, you know, sort of the, the simplest technology to implement and use. Okay, I'd like to open the panel up to questions. Anyone have any questions? Can't see very well. Yeah, yes, do you wanna come up to the mic? Does the mic work? Yeah, no? Okay, you already could just shout. My question is related to, we, we talked about interop, right? And we talk about interop means many things to many people, right? There is um, never so easy as bursting or just moving workloads between different clouds, right? Think of two clouds as two different clouds as two different data centers for clouds. So my question is, um, there have been companies who come into this, like there was Cloud Switch, got acquired by Terramark, Verizon, and there is Rasimi, they do image provisioning and stuff like that, you know? So. Forget the data for a second. Do you see more of that? Do you see the OpenStack community kind of doing that? Data in, um, workload in, worked it out should be all done by OpenStack? Interop with VMware, interop with maybe something else, interop with Amazon. Should that be part of the OpenStack foundation? In and out, basically? It's so interoperability, not just with, with an OpenStack, but with another yeah. environment. Yeah. Uh, from the very beginning, and I remember talking to Jonathan Bryce about this more than once, uh, OpenStack supports Amazon API, so there is interoperability for AMI images coming in, so that's important. What, what I think should also happen, though, uh, and this is an emerging layer, is uh, at the network layer with you know, software-defined networking and this and that, such that I can have the same, what are we talking, layer three domain, I guess, and extend it out so that it's all one piece. That's, that's kind of uh, magic. <laughs> But yeah, I, I think it's absolutely important because the other thing is with fragmentation, nobody wants to have siloed workloads, right? So with OpenStack, I think you're reasonably sure that you're not going, well, if you have standardized uh, hypervisors, you're, you're reasonably sure you're okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, I mean, I think the project's built in API compatibility and the, uh, I mean, I think there's a layer above that, right? You, you come up with the management tools to let you, uh, you know, burst and, and move from, from cloud to cloud. And, uh, you know, maybe that should be part of OpenStack project. Maybe that'll be handled by the, the ecosystem. Um, but, um, you know, I, th I think if OpenStack really wants to be a true open cloud, I mean, I think they really should interoperate with all these other clouds if they're not other platforms. Otherwise, you know, you're just like the thing that you're kind of uh, going up against and you're saying, well, there's lock in there. Well, I mean, maybe, you know, if, if OpenStack only works with other OpenStacks, maybe that's, a little, you know, that's still locking. You're locking to open it. Maybe it's like a larger <laughs> selection of, of vendors and stuff like that, but you still have some lockers. So, I mean, I think, you know, if you can, and, um, you know, I think some of this depends on the other side too, is what is technically possible. Yes, I, I think it should do it. And, um, and uh, I, but I think it just depends whether that, you know, that project should be handled by like foundation, is it part of the core thing? Is it, I mean, that, that's maybe a product technical thing, but I think if philosoph philosophical, yes. Yeah, the, the, the sort of, the, the flying that ointment, you know, in, in many cases is gonna be uh, uh, IP terms, all right? So in other words, when you look at the Amazon API, Amazon has not <laughs> said sort of one way or another, um, you know, what the terms are, the intellectual property terms are with respect to their API, you know, so you can implement it. Um, and you know, a lot of people have, you know, and, but you know, are you legally able to do that? You know, it's, it's a, you know, frankly, it's an open question. Um, you know, there's a reason, for example, that uh, Eucalyptus went out and sort of partnered with Amazon, you know, to try to get those terms sort of down on paper, um, you know, that they were legally able to do that. So, you know, the difficulty here is, is that philosophically, I think all of us would probably agree that yes, everything should interoperate and it's in the best interest of customers, you know, to have the ability to, to you know, sort of move your workloads around with impunity. The difficulty is, is that, you know, sort of the, the vendor agendas, they may argue differently. The only other thing I would add in there, just uh, think about from a networking perspective, uh, we've all been using ethernet for X number of years, uh, but it's only recently, and by recently I mean the last three months, that there's been a standard for interoperability across carrier grade ethernet for quality of service. So if I was handing off from uh, in a carrier hotel between one backbone and another, there was no standard that would guarantee that I had the same quality on both sides. Uh, ethernet is what, 30 years old, give or take now? Uh, so, you know, we talk about interoperability of workloads, but when you're talking about production grade workloads and we want to interoperate and burst and everything else, uh, quality of service and other higher level abstractions are also going to be very important. And nobody's even talking about quality of service or interoperability because that's so far up the chain. But th these things take time. Aren't we starting to see um, the, the spaces fill in a little bit, for instance, with platform as a service um, and using you know services like Cloud Foundry as you know as a gateway into these into these cloud environments? Is that seems like that you know, that's a trend that you know. That I'm seeing, at least, when I, you know, when I look across the market, and, and there's also, you know, lots of other vendors who are trying to do things like make, you know, the code more port portable by, you know, creating that you know, orchestration uh, between, for instance, GitHub and you know, integrating with uh, Chef, so you can, you know, port that code to multiple clouds. So, is this a, is this an, is this a matter where the, you know the vendors are really just trying to are, are taking the lead, and that's just going to make this balkanization even even uh, more pronounced? Well, you know, with respect to the, the, the past front, at least, I mean, I think, you know, the ambition, at least, of many of those projects, you know, and I think certainly the hope for at least some subset of the technical population is that, you know, PaaS can serve essentially as a container, right? You know, very much like, you know, for all of that, uh, it gets a bad rap, and I certainly hated it myself, but J2E middleware, you know, did guarantee the opportunity to effectively move from operating system to operating system, hardware to hardware, and so on, with a minimum of complications. It certainly wasn't right once, run anywhere as it was claimed to be. Um, and I, I think there is hope, you know, that over time, you know, PASS would represent that, but, you know, frankly, that's a long way off. You know, we're not there yet. I think we're out of time, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys.